I made this plasma lamp entirely out of old television components. The main components being the line output transformer and transistors, which supplied the television with a high voltage. It's quite a fun thing. They're sold in some of the large department stores for an amazing amount of money, approaching £2,000, some of the bigger ones. Um, this one was a total cost of about, I suppose, seven or eight pounds. This is the National Museum of Film Photography and Television in Bradford, and this part's all about how television works. I helped design it with the curators a few years ago. In this first display, you can see the spot of light caused by the electrons hitting the phosphors on the back of the screen. If I hold a magnet over the screen, the spot moves, because the beam of electrons is attracted by magnetism. And with an electromagnet strapped round the neck of the tube, the magnetic field can be very accurately controlled so that the spot can be moved precisely anywhere on the screen. And of course, if I move the spot into this patch where we scrape the phosphors off, the spot will disappear. Also, by adjusting the intensity of the electron beam, the brightness of the spot can be varied. In a television, the spot is made to scan the screen line by line. The image is formed by varying the intensity of the spot as it scans. This model uses ink marks on string to represent the variations in intensity of the scanning spot, so you can see how the picture builds up. So if we increase the scanning speed, the illusion of a complete picture starts to appear. The sharpness of the picture depends on the number of lines. Today's sets have 625. The original EMI system had 405, and Baird's had only 240. Gerald Wells, who runs the West Dulwich Radio Museum, has collected some of the first domestic television sets. His earliest set doesn't look like a television at all. It was a Model 900. It was probably the first television in the country of its, of its type. And it was bought out in time for television. Originally, it was dual standard. It had a switch for a 240 line and 405 line, so you could watch with Marconi EMI system or the Baird system. It doesn't look like a television. No, it is. doesn't. Because in those days, the early cathode ray tubes were so long in the neck, the only way you could mount them was vertically with a mirror in the lid. I mean, reverse the scanning coil, so your picture was right way round, and you actually watched it in a mirror. You could watch it either in that position for sitting position, or you could turn it up like that and watch it in the uh, standing position. Or you could close it down altogether, and it just looked quite an inoffensive sort of cabinet. <laughs> As nobody could afford that model at yeah. 100 pounds ago, Marconi EMI bought out the 707 and the 705, which was a 5-inch and 7-inch set, respectively which would sell for 29 guineas and 31 guineas. They maintain that even if a television system failed, and they've had a sort of idea that it might be shut down somehow or other, but at least you had a good quality radio for your money. <laughs> well, they then started getting the screens larger again. They started yes. off with large screens at yeah. nine inch, uh, 12 inch, then went down to 5 and 7, I and mean, then gradually mm. they crept up to 9 inch. With mm. this model, um, with, with, with 709, which is quite a, quite a fine receiver, this one's working a bit, and also a first-class radio. This came out at about £60 and was currently in the shops up till the, the outbreak of war. Which is the earliest example of a post-war set? Well, I'd say it was this nine-inch pie here. Mm. Pies didn't do anything astounding before the war with television. They made a few, they weren't mm. particularly brilliant. And then after the war, with the experience they'd gained from radar and the mm. money they'd made out of the war, they ploughed back into their company. They produced this thing. It was an absolute work of art. It looks much more compact. It's very was, compact, so. beautifully designed, easy to work, had a little panel on the front where you could get at the line hold and frame hold controls to adjust it. 
gave a high definition picture, mm. mirror back to tube, and all the technology we'd learned during the war came out in this. It was brilliant. And this portable here, what's what Well, this is a, looks like a portable. It's a little nine inch bush that came out in 1950. A lovely little bit of engineering, um, also slightly out of adjustment, and um, they made use of a jelly mold with a the Bakelite. It was a lovely substance. It matched their DAC-90 radio it bought out at the same mm. time. It was small, it was compact, it didn't have a large mains transformer in it. It was miniature valves and modern plastics again. This was a lot safer. You couldn't kill yourself on one of these. Well, you could if you were absolutely stupid. But these sets were absolutely lethal. In fact, before the war, we, our main insulating materials, of course, was paper, tar, mm. wax and varnish. The first man to be killed by television was a friend of mine, and that happened up at Newtony Willows uh, in, uh, in the 50s. On the set, I'd actually taken up that, that one of that model. Mm. So I, I do, it was brought home to me very definitely how dangerous these sets were. So this there is was a, no yeah. second chance of it. <laughs> so this is a big improvement. One touch of that, and you're in the service department in the sky. You've had it. But these, if you did catch hold of a high voltage, the resistance of the skin, the moisture in the body, would collapse the voltage. So mm. apart from a very nasty burn, mm. uh, sometimes you even weren't even really aware that you'd burnt yourself until you come to wash your hands in Ajax <laughs> and then you'd know all about it. But you certainly didn't kill. The pictures on these old televisions now have to be converted from today's 625 lines to the old 405 line standard. This converter is a bulky machine and Gerald's now got such a large collection of televisions and radios that the only place he could find for it was next to his bed. Colour television uses three different coloured phosphors, red, green and blue, with a fine metal mesh behind. This mesh has a grid-like pattern of tiny holes or lozenge shapes. This is a mesh we've taken out of a telly and if I hold a torch behind it you can see the holes clearly. Inside the tube there are three electron guns and three separate streams of electrons. The mesh or mask blocks the electrons and only lets them through the holes. So each beam hits the screen in slightly different places. Inside the screen, the three coloured phosphors are laid in fine strips, here shown greatly enlarged. When the mask is in place, each electron gun, here shown by holes in white card, only reaches one colour of phosphor. Now look closely at an actual television. You can see the grid-like pattern over the whole screen created by the mesh. And if you look even closer through a magnifying glass, you can see the three coloured phosphors. As the picture changes, you can see that any colour can be created by just varying the relative intensity of the three phosphors. Even white is obtained by mixing the three. <laughs> 